you all for coming this evening. And I want to thank my professional colleagues at the University of Minnesota for having me. I've had a, a lovely two days here so far. And I look forward to uh, spending more time here. Tonight, I'm speaking on rebuilding the community, Jewish life in Germany after the Holocaust. It would be no exaggeration to say that the Nazis decimated European Jewish life, especially in Eastern and Central Europe. Germans lost World War II, their country was destroyed, powerful German military was rendered impotent. But the war against the Jews was the war that Hitler won. And the focal point of it, of course, was Germany. The Nazis wanted to create a Germany without Jews, and by 1945, they had more or less succeeded. But after the war, despite the Holocaust, and despite enduring anti-Semitism, Jewish life returned to Germany. Now, at first, it was a few thousand Jews. It went up to nearly 200,000 Jews at one point before dropping to 20,000. Then over time, it doubled. And after 1990, Germany became a focal point for Jewish immigration so that nearly 200,000 Jews live in Germany today. But it all goes back to the first few years after the war and after the Holocaust. Why and how did Jews return to Germany after the Holocaust? Who were these Jews? And how could they rebuild Jewish life there in the midst of society that had been so hostile to them. And that's the story I want to tell you tonight. Now first, I'd like to give you a little background. Before the Nazi seizure of power, the Jewish community of Germany numbered between 500,000 and 600,000. It was less than 1% of the total German population. And while many internationally known scientists, some leading politicians were Jews, most average Jews lived relatively pedestrian lives. Additionally, the average German Jew was only nominally religious, and the community was one of the most assimilated in the world. Aside from pervasive societal anti-Semitism, one of the greatest challenges facing the community was its lack of internal cohesion. Religious Jews often did not associate with secular Jews, and an even greater hazard separated culturally German Jews, so-called Yekas, from the recent immigrants from Eastern Europe who were known as the Ostjuden. And the former, the German-born Jews, culturally German Jews, they led the community and they used grandfather clauses and other chicanery to keep the Eastern Jews from gaining control over congregations, even where they might have been numerically larger. This engendered much resentment and mutual distrust. Historically, Jewish life in Germany has been very hierarchically structured. While a larger city or town might have multiple synagogues, especially before 1945, these were always organized into a single municipal official Jewish community, known in German as the Gemeinde, or in Hebrew as the Kehillah. And the various local Jewish communities united on a regional or state level, and then since 1950 on a national level. These communities and their various organs are responsible for every imaginable facet of Jewish life in Germany, including supervision of religious practice, and kosher observance, and social welfare functions. In May 1945, only 1,500 out of 500,000 pre-war German Jews survived inside Germany. Most of them had survived by going underground or through the efforts of their non-Jewish spouses. Some German Jews had survived in the camps, and others had fled abroad. And when the war ended, many of them tried to return to their former hometowns. But many of them also migrated to the large cities like Berlin or Frankfurt, Hamburg, Munich, etc. But we're still talking about a relatively small number of survivors. Here's a picture of German Jewish Holocaust survivors demonstrating in the ruins of Berlin in 1945. You can see the rubble behind them. And their banner reads, 
Jewish community in Berlin, 186,000 members in 1933, 5,100 members in 1945. And there were maybe 15,000 German Jews throughout Germany at this point. On the other hand, there were thousands and thousands of Eastern European Jewish concentration camp survivors who had forcibly come to Germany in the last months of the war on the so-called death marches from Poland ahead of the advance of Russia. Most of these displaced persons wanted to go to Palestine. And since Palestine was under British control, many DPs made their way to the British zone of occupation in northern Germany. And despite their wish to leave Europe for Palestine, actually doing so was relatively difficult, nearly impossible. At the time, the British government severely restricted Jewish immigration to the territory, and they actually wanted to send the Jews back to their countries of origin, to their native countries. Since they refused to go, they remained stranded in displaced persons camps, DB camps, in Western Germany. This is a demonstration of Jews in the British occupation zone protesting against the return of Jewish survivors who had attempted to make it to Palestine. Well, stuck in Germany, the DPs built up their own society. They elected camp committees, which then sent representatives to the Central Committee of Liberated Jews in their zone. And this is from the Central Committee in the British zone. Now, at this early stage, they were still developing an awareness of their status and their identity. They still called themselves Heflings prisoners or inmates. And you can see that they're looking to the past, to the Holocaust, in a memorial fashion. And they're looking to the future in Eretz Israel. They have some Hebrew, but they're mainly Yiddish speaking at this point. The Central Committee of Jewish DPs in each occupation zone took over the internal administration of the DP camps from the Allies, at least as far as they were allowed to. And their projects included schools, hospitals, theaters, newspapers, even political education, a highly Zionist orientation. Now, as this poster illustrates, the DPs were encouraged by foreign Jewish groups to get training in agriculture and artisanal crafts. Why? So they could take these skills with them to Palestine someday. And many of them did after Israeli independence, but many did not. They stayed in Germany. So to sum up where we are so far, during the initial years after the war, so from 1945 to 1949, there were really two parallel Jewish communities in Germany. There was the community of old German Jews who wanted to reestablish themselves and who tended to live in big cities. And then there were the Eastern European displaced persons, stuck in occupied Western Germany. And it fell to these two disparate groups of Holocaust survivors to relight the flame of Jewish life in Germany. And needless to say, they needed help. They were not going to find much help from the Germans. Many Germans were still anti-Semitic. And even if they were not, they were too busy with their own concerns, trying to re rebuild bombed out cities. So for support, the Jews turned to the victorious allies. The Allies' decisions regarding the Jews were critical in determining the future of Judaism on German soil. Now, already we've seen that if the British had allowed the Jews free access to Palestine in 1945, the seeds of a renewed Jewish community in Germany might never have been planted. Even before the war's conclusion, the Allied authorities had devised a policy to deal with reintegrating Jews into German life. But the plan was based on German Jews. No one foresaw the large number of Holocaust survivors from Eastern Europe who would refuse to go home once they were on Allied-occupied German soil. The US Army and the United Nations Re uh, Relief and Rehabilita Rehabilitation Administration were just completely unprepared for the scope of the Jewish problem. Ultimately, the US Army appointed a Jewish advisor to the American theater commander to mediate between the disgruntled DPs and the army. And more and more, the American commander came to rely upon his Jewish advisor for advice regarding Jewish questions, which included uh, the underground pipeline to Palestine. 
In fact, the Jewish advisor was critical in making sure that there would be Jewish life in Germany, even after Israeli independence, even after the Americans ended their occupation. The situation was bad in 1945, but it grew worse in 1946 and 1947, as communist governments came to power in Eastern Europe and as anti-Semitism re reared its ugly head once again, thousands of Jews in Poland, Hungary, and Romania fled to the West. Where did they go? They went to Germany, and specifically to the American zone of occupation. This was already a difference from what we saw before with the first wave. Why? The British had made it almost impossible to leave their zone once inside. On the other hand, the American zone of occupation was already crowded with ethnic Germans who had fled from Poland after the war. Therefore, American officials sometimes turned a blind eye to Jews who illegally left the zone to go to Palestine. Meanwhile, the US Army worked with DP leaders in the displaced persons camps, representing the DPs who stayed behind. Well, in 1948, there was a breakthrough in the DP problem. When Israel gained its independence, there was no reason to keep the Jewish DPs isolated in Germany. And in one year, the number of DPs shrank from around 200,000 to 66,000. And then half of those would soon leave. So the Jewish population in West Germany was reaching a stable core. Well, as I stated, almost immediately after liberation, German Jews usually returned to their hometowns or to big cities and they restarted their congregations. Therefore, the Jewish community in the cities was overwhelmingly German, while the DP camps remained overwhelmingly Eastern European. Historic antagonisms, language, culture, religiosity, all separated the two groups. However, the foundation of Israel led to a drastic diminution in the number of Jewish DPs, and the army began closing the DP so the 15,000 Jewish DPs who were staying in Germany moved into the cities. And they joined congregations already established by the German Jews. So these Eastern European Jews would form the bulk of the Jewish community in Germany. On the other hand, pre-war German Jews provided the leadership. Now in Northern Germany, there were very few problems. But in Southern Germany, the area of the American occupation zone, there were significant problems. Because of the British attitude regarding Palestine, the American zone ended up having a massive population of Eastern European Jewish displaced persons. And when the Eastern European DPs joined the local Jewish communities, these newcomers overwhelmed the communities. This unleashed tremendous hostility from the German Jews. Well, for, Jew for Jewish life in Germany to be successful, the remnants of the DP communities. And the German Jewish congregations would have to work together despite their mutual distrust. Additionally, the response of Jewish groups abroad provided another major complication. International Jewish groups, including the World Jewish Congress and the Zionist organization opposed any permanent Jewish settlement in Germany. In fact, the World Jewish Congress issued a symbolic ban on such settlement. Jewish groups around the world wanted the last Jews in Germany to leave and to go to Israel. They essentially cut them off, ostracized those who were choosing to remain. In this climate of antagonism and uncertainty, the American army intervened. <laughs> In 1949, as the Americans were ending their occupation, the American commander's Jewish advisor organized a series of conferences on the future of Jewish life in Germany. This is a picture of the most important conference held in July 1949. The Jewish advisor invited representatives of the German Jewish congregations, DP leaders, and envoys from American Jewish organizations. And the Jewish advisor made it clear that Jews were going to stay in Germany. This was a fact. It was the reality of the situation. As a result, 
the Jews in Germany needed to organize themselves for representative purposes. But despite this American pressure, the real catalyst for Jewish unity post-war Germany was the new West German government. In September 1949, Konrad Adenauer became the first post-war chancellor, and Theodor Heuss became the first president of Germany. They were genuinely interested in German-Jewish reconciliation, and they wanted a Jewish partner for discussion. But the Jews had no single representative with whom they could speak. The communities were disorganized. So how did the West German government respond? It decided to appoint its own advisor for Jewish affairs to be placed within the Interior Ministry. So the official representative for Jewish interests in West Germany was going to be appointed by the German government, serve in the German government, and represent the Jews' interests for a dialogue leading to reconciliation. Needless to say, this proposal drew outrage from Jewish groups. They did not want non-Jewish Germans choosing their leadership. And finally, the Jews overcame their hesitations, and in the summer of 1950, they founded a central representative institution for all the Jews in Germany. This is the Central Council of Jews in Germany. This is a side note. This organization still exists today. It represents approximately 110,000 members of about 200,000 Jews in Germany. And simply because of the weight of history, its leadership, the Central Council's leadership, has far greater influence over German intellectual and political life than its membership might otherwise merit. It's a well-known institution in German political life. And in fact, some of its, its previous presidents have been really nationally known figures in German public discourse. Well, almost immediately upon its establishment, the new Central Council convinced the German government to abandon this idea for an advisor for Jewish affairs. So having united and established a central administrative body, the Jews in Germany turned their attention to the pressing issues confronting them. And chief among them was securing funds for their institutions and financial aid for themselves. After all, these are communities of destitute Holocaust survivors. They have very pressing social welfare needs and they do not have access. So they need funds. How do they do it? How are they going to get these funds? The leaders of the Jewish community use their connections to German political elites. And here are the leaders of the community meeting with the president of Germany. Jewish leaders worked very hard to cultivate new ties or to exploit old ones. Hometown connections were used. One Jewish leader had lived before the war in the same city as a non-Jewish leader. This might have been a point of contact. Membership in the same political party or even social clubs from before the Nazi era was a frequent source of connection. Others worked behind the scenes for one political party or another, hoping that their post-49 political affiliations would actually yield fruit for the Jewish community. I mean, it's natural to think that these Jewish leaders expected their hard work to pay dividends. And when a prominent Berlin Jew campaigned for the conservative Christian Democrats in 1950 and 1951, I am sure that he expected some sort of symbolic compensation for his efforts. One of the most influential Jews in post-war Germany publisher of the main Jewish newspaper, the Allgemeine Wolkenzeitung, the Juden in Deutschland, actually a short one here. He would intentionally mute criticisms of some officials who gave the community what it wanted. And what did Jewish groups want? They wanted compensation for individual Holocaust survivors. They wanted collective reparations to Israel, they want the return of all confiscated property, and they want subsidies for Jewish institutions, such as congregations and rest homes. Did these occur? Well, not immediately. So what made the difference? Foreign diplomacy. When West Germany wanted readmittance to the community of nations, it felt it needed to make a grand symbolic gesture. It needed to prove that it was a new Germany, a democratic Germany. 
What could it do to prove its, uh, its democratic credentials to the world? What gesture would do? The gesture would be Holocaust reparations paid to Israel and international Jewish groups. And after months and months of negotiations, West Germany signed an agreement with Israel. And this is the actual treaty signed ceremony. One side of the table is the German, the right side is the German delegation, on the left side is the Israeli delegation. Was the Central Council of Jews in Germany a party to this agreement? No. Did German legal experts who had written extensively on reparations help negotiate it? No. Israel and international Jewish groups were not interested in the assistance, to put it that way, of German Jews living in Germany for the purposes of Holocaust reparations. However, after the treaty was signed, the West German government did begin funding many German Jewish institutions, including the Central Council of Jews in Germany. This group began receiving an annual subsidy. Around the same time, the West German parliament approved reparations to individual victims of the Holocaust. These two steps helped ensure the continued existence of Jewish life in Western Germany. So through the goodwill of the new democratic West German government, Jewish communities were able to survive in Germany despite adverse conditions, despite residual anti-Semitism, and despite continued hostility from Jewish groups abroad. I'd like to speak for a few minutes about Eastern Germany, where the Jewish communities faced a different challenge. There, communist politics and debates on entitlement plagued the community and its central administration. German Jews returning home from the concentration camps wished to refound their congregations. But to exist as an official organization in the Soviet occupation zone, these religious communities needed to be licensed by the local government, which in Eastern Germany was usually dominated by the communists. Many East German communists and many Soviets did not approve of this effort of the reestablishment of the Jewish communities and they refused to authorize some congregations. <laughs> now, there were two reasons for this general anti-Jewish attitude. One, the communists did not endorse organized religion. Two, the Jews were the one social group within the German population that had a greater claim to victimhood than the communists themselves. In the German communist worldview, there having been the Nazis' principal political opponent justified their post-war rule. In their own mind, they were the Nazis' primary enemy, and they predicated their claim to power on the legacy of persecution and resistance. They were the ultimate anti-Nazis. They were the true anti-fascists. And in a post-Nazi, post-fascist, or in an anti-fascist Germany, the group that should rule should be the most anti-fascist group, which was, in their mind, the communists. Unfortunately, this meant that they felt that Jewish claims to have been the Nazis' primary target undermined their own claim to power. Moreover, they perceived Jewish calls for reparations to be a rejection of their worldview. After all, the Jews are asking for reparations from the German government. And who is now the German government? It's the communists, who claim that they are anti-Nazis. So not only did they not consider themselves responsible for the Nazis' crimes, they felt that they were victims as great or greater than the Jews. So how did the Jews respond? They founded a representative organization very early on, in 1946, called the State Organization State Association of Jewish Communities in the Russian Occupation Zone, was led by a single man, uh, Julius Meyer, Julius Meyer. And he's all the way on the right. <laughs> Meyer was a communist, and he knew the ins and outs of power politics in East Germany. He's unabashed in his pursuit of justice for Jewish Holocaust survivors, 
and eventually his efforts cost him his freedom and nearly his life. There's an additional fact, uh, facet to consider here. While the Jews were antagonized by the Communist Party, the East German government was technically a multi-party coalition. Now, it's true that the communists dominated the government of East Germany. But to preserve the fiction of a multi-party national front government, all the democratic forces together in a post-Nazi Germany, to preserve this fiction, communists did not hold every governmental post. In fact, the cabinet member who was assigned supervision of the religious communities was not a communist. This man here, Otto Nuschke, he was a Christian Democrat who had Jewish colleagues before the war. And with his help, the Jewish communities received funding for the reconstruction of synagogues and the restoration of cemeteries. However, the topic of Holocaust reparations remained taboo. The third rail of discourse. In the early 1950s, official anti-Semitism swept across Eastern Europe. It culminated in the show trials of Jewish communists. Some of you may have heard the Slansky trials in Czechoslovakia. Part of a larger trend in Eastern Europe at this time. Around New Year's 1953, pro-Jewish communists, as I say, non-Jewish communists who were pro-Jewish, follow me, were purged from the East German Communist Party. Jewish communal leaders were arrested, chief among them Julius Meyer, the communist leader of the Jewish State Association. As soon as the secret police let these leaders go home, they fled to West Berlin. In the Soviet Union, Stalin was unfolding his doctor's plot conspiracy. Now, fortunately, his death in March 1953 brought an end to the worst excesses of the anti-Semitic purges, which tapered off by the end of the year. But after this episode, with the leadership of the East German Jewish community, now in West Germany, or even in emigration in places like South America, the Communist Party appointed lackeys that had the main Jewish communities. Moreover, the, the autonomy and the independence and the influence of the Jewish community in East Germany was broken. All debates on relative victimhood stopped. And from 1953 until the 1980s, the minuscule Jewish community in East Germany eked out a quiet existence in the shadow. Undisturbed, largely ignored. So to conclude and to summarize, Ethnic rivalry and mistrust separated the Jews in post-war Western Germany and prevented them from unifying. Only when faced with a combination of pressure from the withdrawing American occupiers, isolation by international Jewish groups, and attempts by the West German government to intervene in intra-Jewish affairs did the Jews unite, forming the basis of today's Jewish community in Germany. And even then, the fragile existence of Jewish institutions was guaranteed by subsidies from the West German government. It is Germans, non-Jewish Germans, who guaranteed that Jewish life would continue to exist in Germany. In East Germany, deep-seated opposition from the Communist Party, which did have a fine anti-Nazi record, made Jewish life there unstable and even dangerous until 1953, by which point the already small community was radically diminished in size. And that is how the community continued to exist until 1990, and everything changed. Thank you. Okay.